Welcome, welcome to The Long Road. My name is Chris Roberts, your host. I'm here with... Kelly Steiner from Anana Voices. We're going to be talking about prescription drugs and prescription drug abuse. And I'm going <clears> to... <throat> Be fair, I cheated. I went and changed my shirt. <laughs> so if people see you two weeks in a row, at least they know that you were here for two hours. You didn't wear the same clothes for two weeks. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. <laughs> and um, the young guest that we had last, time, last hour, last show, did a great job. But he was really kind of embarrassed that he flubbed a few. He did a great job. He didn't flub a few. But like we were talking off, off screen with... We're not like Oprah or any of the other shows. We don't have a teleprompter. We don't have all the questions pre-asked and pre-answered. It's a free-flowing show. So we're being as honest as we can, and sometimes we flub. We're just being natural people. And I like to tell people I'll steal from Oprah. We're here to be a teacher. And the idea is to provide as much information to the community so they can say, why didn't I think of that? And they become better educated and to hopefully get involved at the same time. And, and thank you for that opening. Scott did a great job in the uh, last show. And uh, today we are here to talk about prescription drugs a little bit. Um, we talked previously about athletes and how their performance is affected, and obviously prescription drugs plays into that. But uh, more importantly, prescription drugs have become the number one drug of choice that's on the rise. Um, a lot of that due to the accessibility of it, um, the inability to dispose of it properly, and people hanging on to it. And um, also what we're seeing is that we talked about young ladies previously. Um, again, this is a category or a substance that we are seeing young ladies utilizing and um, perceiving uh, two-thirds of girls that were surveyed uh, responded that it helped them cope with problems at home and over half of them responded um, that it helped them just forget their troubles and this is prescription drugs specifically so we definitely see an increasing trend again with the female population um, but among the college population very um, significant increase in use of things like Adderall and Ritalin and sharing of those substances. It's, well, one, I mean, throwing my prescription drugs down the toilet is not a good way to get rid of them. <laughs> <coughs> no, and I, we've had this discussion before, Chris. <laughs> yeah. You know, people tend to, um, because we haven't had a means to dispose of them, uh, we have seen that people primarily flush them down the toilet. It does have environmental effects. Um, it can get into our water supply. You know, the other thing is that um, if you're hoarding or storing those unused, unwanted, expired medications, whether they're prescription medications that are controlled or non-controlled, or uh, medications that you've purchased over the counter, um, you know, if you're under a doctor's prescription, it's, you know, it has med medical benefits. Um, you want to follow a doctor's advice. But if that is an unused or unwanted expired, you want to dispose of it. And we are very fortunate here in the Monadnock region because we have some other <laughs> options for people than flushing down the toilet or dumping down the sink now or throwing in the mm -hmm. sewer. Um, and on October 29th, we'll be doing another Take Back Day. I think you're aware we've done some one-day take-back um, events. And we have collected over 1,000 pounds now in the Monadnock region in three of those events um, of unused, unwanted, expired medications. And um, it, one of those, just one of those events, we collected 7,000 controlled substances um, during that event. So you can see it's a significant issue. Um, the one on October 29th will um, be hosted in um, locations in the Monadnock region. More PR will come out on that in the future. And, but one of the, say if um, my mother passed l last month and she had cancer and she had a, a bunch of morphine, and so what am I supposed to do? Wait months and months until there's another one? Well, you know, we've been working hard at this um, in the Monadnock region. We've had a lot of support from um, the Cheshire County government 
and the coalitions in the area. Uh, and collectively, that group has really advocated, and as you know, because you're a legislator, <laughs> um, there was uh, new legislation introduced, HB 71, which made it a little bit easier for uh, disposal of medications. What that's resulted in here in the Monadnock region is we now will have our first permanent disposal location that will be available 24-7. Um, people will be able to bring in their controlled and non-controlled substances and over-the-counter. You cannot bring in needles um, and hazardous waste um, types of things. You know, we'll have information that goes out publicly on this, but that will be located at the Keene Police Department. The, um, again, as we're doing some research around the country, some of the, one of the problems that the police were concerned about there had been incidents where family members or other ones have taken illegal drugs from members and dumped them in the thing. But that creates a chain of custody problems for police officers. But we handled that with the bill? Uh, you did handle that with the bill because, um, you know, the reality is if somebody is wanting to bring in and legally dispose of something, I don't think the police are going mm -hmm. to question that. You know, obviously there is enforcement issues attached to the diversion of um, drugs uh, mm. for illicit use. Uh, but, you know, people that are com bringing in the, um, you use the example of somebody who had passed away. And, you know, if you're cleaning out their medicine cabinets and bringing that in uh, to the police department to dispose of, um, that is, the disposal location is anonymous. Um, and you're just going to be able to come in. It looks like a giant mailbox, and it's bolted to the floor in there. Um, it, because the department's open 24-7, you have access to actually disposing in that. Um, and then they, from there, will bring it to the hazardous waste disposal um, locations. So it remains in law enforcement's custody once you dispose of it. But absolutely, you can get rid of it. And uh, I had the chance to present at the Governor's Commission the other day, and um, Commissioner Tumpas from Department of Health and Human Services um, came over to me, and he had just experienced this himself um, with losing a family member and, and cleaning out their medicine cabinets and finding things from the 1970s on. Um, and, and unfortunately, as a society, you know, as we've seen more prescription drugs um, being prescribed, um, you know, more medications available to help people, we have more out there, more accessibility to it. Um, we also have people that are ending up with a lot in their medicine cabinets, um, and we tend not to dispose of it. We tend to just push it to the back and, and leave it. So what we're encouraging is with this option now, um, you have both the take back event on the 29th, or you have any time you'd like to, to be able to dispose at the Keen PD. Um, and we talk about the Keene PD, was it Seabrook, I think, was the only one prior, prior to the pass of the law? Seabrook was um, flying a little bit under the radar <laughs> over there, and, uh, you know, but took the initiative and took the, um, you know, saw it as a need and an opportunity. And, uh, you know, we're doing ours a little bit differently. We are so lucky here to have community support. Uh, we wanted to get one of these boxes and didn't have the resources to do it. And uh, one of the folks from one of the coalitions and the chair, Tan Nguyen, uh, were out uh, presenting to the Rotary Club. And the Rotary Club felt like this was something they can do. So the Keene Rotary Club has actually sponsored the purchase of this box. And um, we are very thankful to them uh, for their good citizenship and providing this opportunity for the whole Monadnock region. Good. Any drugs that you can get off the street is better for the whole community. Absolutely. You know, I said we had already taken just in three one-day events over a thousand pounds of uh, medications. And, you know, I've been at uh, those events, and it's, it's just amazing to see what we have coming in. And, uh, you know, I had um, someone just share a story with me of something that happened to one of our, the young people in our region where... She and her boyfriend or friend went out. Um, they were going to go out partying for the night, high schoolers. And uh, his mom's girlfriend, um, uh, boyfriend rather, was uh, on methadone. And uh, they accessed the methadone out of the uh, medicine cabinet. And she took it and she OD'd. 
um, when she combined it with alcohol. Fortunately, she survived. But you know, here's an example of it was accessible. Um, parents didn't know that it had disappeared from the cabinet, and uh, you know, just was misused, and it nearly cost a life. Uh, very close of it in a in a young lady who honor student, you know, athlete. We just talked about athletes. Uh, real high performing kid in the school surprised everyone um, that it could happen to her, but it can happen to anyone. It's almost kind of like the Bible. Lead us not into temptation. If you, uh, you <coughs> are a perfect student, you'd never suspect it, but if it's laying right out there, you, you, you're tempting a kid. You're putting on the peer pressure. Getting rid of this will eliminate a lot of the temptation. Absolutely, and you know the reality is for a lot of people they may get a prescription um, and you know pain relievers being pr probably one of the primary ones. Hydrocortisone is... Yeah, and uh, Oxycontin, Oxycontin and things like that. Um, but you know one of the um, major things that happens is say you have a root canal and yeah. you know you, they give you a five day worth. supply, ten day supply and you need one. Um, or some people don't need any at all. And, uh, you know, I'd really encourage you to talk with your doctor about what you think you're going to need and whether you're going to need it. And uh, I think lots of times it's better to have less and go ask for more um, rather than having to, to stockpile it in your um, medicine cabinet and then wait for these one-day events. And, again, we don't have to wait for the one-day events anymore. But get rid of it. Um, it makes you susceptible, susceptible to crime um, yourself, uh, you know, whether it's a home invasion. We do see more crime related to this right now, both in the Monadnock region and nationally, uh, where people are, you know, stealing it and diverting it for um, illicit purposes. And, uh, you know, it's not worth having there. And it's not worth putting your children at risk, certainly. You know, the um, over-the-counter uh, medications, for example, have the highest rate of poisoning for kids under five. Um, you know, that aspirin that's sitting in your um, closet that's expired, you know, keep it out of the reach of the, the kids. They t so many things taste like candy now um, for these young people. The, um, <clears throat> when you're talking about girls, high, high school and college students um, getting more involved in, in some, of, some of the drugs, and especially the prescription drugs, I'll date myself a bit. But it would be kind of like when I was growing up as a teenager, Mick Jagger and the Rolling Stones, mom's little helper. And they said, hey, no big deal. As long as the doctor prescribes it, it's, there's no danger. It's mom's little helper. It makes her get through the day. Bingo, it reduces her stress. And that was Valiant and some of the other ones. But it's almost kind of like you're saying is some of the girls, some of the teenagers think, oh, this is just my helper just to help me get through the day there is no problem because it's a prescription drug. Well, that, that is an attitude that our culture in general has begun to believe that if a doctor prescribed it, it must be all right. Um, the reality is you can still misuse it. If a doctor has prescribed it, they've descri prescribed it for you, for you as an individual for a specific purpose, um, not for your friend, um, not for your other family member, um, which we frequently see happen. Um, and um, also, you know, we are challenged with the whole senior population and, you know, that they're, um, they have to use multiple medications lots of times and a doctor will prescribe and then it doesn't work and they change that prescription. Prescriptions are very, very expensive and what we see is people are hoarding them or keeping them in the hopes that they can use them or they end up misusing them because when they run out of the prescription they are supposed to be on, they'll switch back to using that without the doctor's prescription thinking that, well, I'm still treating myself because the doctor originally put me on this. We are in the process of working with Keene State College, the Health and Society class there. We're going to have 40 students working, um, talking with seniors out in the Monadnock region, talking with um, law enforcement and talking with college students to see if we can gather a little bit more information about what are some of the behaviors attached to how people are using these prescription drugs, whether they're using them the way they're supposed to use them, and then how they're disposing of them. And then our, our plan is to actually do some strategic planning based on that information. The, um, I'd call them the cocktails. You, you, 
you go in, if I go to downtown, if I'm walking from here downtown, there's a convenience store and it'll be changing out because the middle school is no longer downtown. But that convenience store about three o'clock, I'll be seeing fifth, sixth, seventh graders with these high energy drinks. Sometimes you'll see them pouring stuff into the high energy drinks. And there's been a number of reports around the country where some, um, because they're mixing high energy drinks and alcohol, and now some of them high energy drinks, alcohol and prescription drugs, and they have no idea what's happening. They don't, and you know, we have, um, we have that going on, and we have farming parties going on where kids will take whatever medications they can find, throw them in a pot, mix them together, and then you take a handful and you take those along with alcohol, um, figuring you're gonna, you don't know what your high is going to be. Um, unfortunately, you also don't know what all the other consequences are going to be when you do that. We have to remember that when somebody's prescribed, for example, high blood pressure medication, um, and you take that and don't know you're, that's what you're taking, and you mix that with alcohol, that has, can have severe consequences, including death um, for people. And um, that's unfortunately what we see happening. And the energy drinks, absolutely a huge issue. Um, a lot of parents like to see um, their kids using them because they think it gives them more energy and things. And, uh, you know, there's been a lot of support, but now the, the science is really showing that there's some pretty negative effects to that. Um, and it's a, it's a temporary um, thing, just like a drug is. The, and sometimes I kind of do the, the Forrest Gump thing. I'm saying, this doesn't really make sense to me. Parents will cut down the amount of sugar they want their kids to have because it says it gives them too much energy, makes them too active, but they have no problem pumping them up and allow them to drink the high energy drinks. Um, you know, when you talk with parents, a lot of them think that it has to do with, uh, it helps their kids focus, um, which I find really interesting because I think I'm, in, I'm with you that uh, I think all we're doing is pumping them up with a bunch of really drugs. Um, you know, they may be legal, but they're still um, a drug going into your body. And cigarettes is legal too. Absolutely. It? And, you know, they have health consequences and they have social consequences. Um, and, and we have to remember that. And the social consequences in this case, you know, are um, to our environment and to, um, uh, Even you to know. your pocketbook. Oh, abso <laughs> absolutely. Economic, economically, no question um, that, you know, there is significant impact uh, in terms of this. And then when you look at the cost to um, lives, you know, whether it's our... Um, our young, young children, our youth, our young adults, senior citizens, and ultimately our pets, too. Um, you know, there's consequences there. That, again, is also where we see the highest rate of overdose when um, an animal's brought to the vet. It's because they've swallowed something. You know, an animal runs for whatever gets dropped <laughs> on the floor, typically. And, uh, you know, they can get into your, your um, medications. In a couple of shows ago, we had talked about um, <clears throat> how parents can now be legally be held responsible if there's if other underage drinkers access alcohol in their property yes. on their property. There's we call it a, it's a civil penalty. You can be civilly sued along with the legal consequences. There's a social host liability law, <clears throat> and maybe parents are not thinking about it, but. To me, if I took it to the next level, if there's a social host responsibility law for leaving alcohol, the alcohol closet unlocked, allowing kids to have a potty in my house, go to the bathroom and open the uh, medicine cabinet and take out um, four or five um, painkillers and to go and parents go, well, no, there's no requirement. I think there's going to be some liability there. I think that sounds like some good legislation <laughs> for one of our <laughs> legislators to bring <clears throat> forward, Chris, because I think you're absolutely right. Um, and unfortunately, again, it is what we see that, you know, uh, most people keep things stored in their medicine cabinet or on their kitchen shelves. And uh, you open the door and it's right there. And, you know, we have to remember that as things expire, they actually change their potency levels. Um, and can be very, very damaging in relation to that. 
you know, my husband reminds me quite fondly <laughs> of uh, a situation where we had some Bengay that had <laughs> expired, <laughs> and he asked me to put it on his back, and, you know, he let out a yell like I hadn't heard <laughs> from him in a while, and he said, this burns, and come to find out when I spoke mm -hmm. with the nurse that it was because it had expired and gained its this potency level um, and changed its chemical composition. Well, when you're just talking about the my wife takes a couple of prescriptions and I just realized she has them all laid out right by the coffee pot yep. because when she gets up in the morning she presses it and gets the coffee and then she says well I don't want to forget my uh, medicine so when she gets her coffee she opens the three bottles and takes her medicine right with her first cup of coffee in the morning yeah. and when we sit and look at it if you have kids around the house or you have well, you have older kids and they have guests <clears throat> coming in very easily. Kids can bring, knock it down in these childproof um, caps. I can tell you my two-year-old grandson can open can them because he said, oh, yeah, push down and, and turn. Yeah. And I think, you know, we've got a couple of things we um, are working on. One is educating young people um, more thoroughly on um, that, you know, when a prescription drug is given um, to an individual, it is given to that individual. <coughs> it's not um, something that you share. You know, you may be given something because you have back problems or a headache, um, you have migraines, and, you know, you have a guest come over and you say, oh, well, I got something I can give you that helps with that. Um, we've got to move away from that attitude because um, that's, you know, when young people look at that, they say, well, you know, geez, there's a pill for everything, and uh, I just got to ask. And uh, even if it's not mine, it's okay to share it. I just presented in high schools, and we're going to be doing a whole project with middle school and high schoolers um, that will be available to all of our area schools, um, beginning to educate kids about this a little bit more and set some norms or, or um, again, we're back to the values um, around how they use prescription drugs and why they're using prescription drugs. And it's not just them, it's senior citizens too. And it's adults. Um, our behavior is not real great around this. Um, you know, we are a society that has had a lot more available to us. Um, and as that's become available, we um, haven't developed a real sense of responsibility around what that means, I think. And, uh, you know, senior citizens uh, were definitely having some issues with, uh, you know, again, them hoarding um, to use for later use. But they're also selling to their friends um, because they're figuring, you know, they're expensive. And um, if I can't use it, I might as well get a little bit money to pay for my next one and that I need. And the economy is bad. And the economy is bad. Cost of living increase you know, for a couple of years. and we're we're very aware of this, um, you know, going on. And it is of concern because, um, again, we're back to really illicit um, and unused um, medications going where they shouldn't be going. When, when you're talking about how drugs are prescribed for the individual, it brought me back when. My daughter was young. We took her to the hospital because she, <clears throat> she had an infection. And they gave her a steroid, steroid pills. And about a day and a half later, we had to rush her back because she had all blood blisters and everything. And we were trying to figure, she was 65 pounds. When the doctor wrote, wrote it down, the, the pharmacist filled it for 165 pounds. So she was giving a, a bigger pill based on weight. And so, yeah. If, you, if, your, if your grandmother is only 110 pounds and you take it for someone else, it's a totally different reaction. Go Absolutely. Right to ben Gay. And, and, you know, that's, that's what I'm saying is it's prescribed for you as an individual. It's based on your weight, your needs. Um, Sometimes age, the whole way. Age, the whole, that's all factored into this. You know, we are, one of the other pieces we've been working on um, for the last eight months, really the Monadnock region, I have to say, has led the way in the state of New Hampshire. We have done so much work around this um, and had so much support from the Cheshire County government and the um, coalitions in this area. Cheshire Hospital 2020. Cheshire, great Cheshire Hospital. Um, uh, we've worked with Dr. Seddon Savage from um, Dartmouth. Mm. She's actually put a webinar together that we worked with her on, um, and that's going to go. We've got requests coming now from all over New England. It's going to release the New Hampshire Medical Society and things. But that's for the healthcare professionals. 
professionals on overprescribing. It's on pain medication management and overprescribing because we also have to do some education there. Um, the other thing is that um, folks may be familiar with our underage drinking um, brochure that we did, and Cheshire Medical has been working um, with us and um, the Keen Sentinel um, as well to put together one on prescription drugs now. So parents will be seeing this coming out much like they did the underage drinking one as an educational tool for them to understand the impact on the body and things. The, um, when you're talking about parents, this is my third term on the um, Keene School Board. It was a break, especially my first two terms. I would say the majority of the drug problems that we had wasn't illegal drugs, it was prescription drugs. And they cause a problem is because what is, what is abuse? And so if you're supposed to be four hours in between and I decide to take it two hours and it's having a negative effect on me, how does the nurse know if I'm abusing it or I'm having a, an adverse reaction? Well, you're misusing it um, yeah. because as you're not taking it as prescribed. And uh, ag again, that's where we need to work with our young people in the educational system. Um, the Medical Reserve Corps through the Public Health Network um, with Eileen Fernandez is um, working with us um, so that we can bring some education to the schools in the area. Um, and it's addressing things like that. <coughs> and so, again, the next one is when? October 29th is the next um, one-day prescription take-back um, event, and that will be in the Monadnock Reed. That will actually be all over the country. Okay. Um, that's going to be co-sponsored by the Drug Enforcement Agency again. Um, those events are always anonymous. Um, you can bring over-the-counter and um, controlled and non-controlled uh, met prescription medications to those events. We ask that you bring them in their original mm -hmm. containers um, with all your identifying information scratched out on those, um, but leave the name of the substance on it uh, and the quantity uh, on it and the date as well. And then um, when it comes to disposing at the Keene Police Department, um, you'll just be able to bring it in just like the, that you do for the one day event and um, put it in the box. When is that going to start up or has it already started up? Um, it has not started yet. The box is in. It's actually installed over there. Um, we're getting together the um, signs. We want to do a public um, information release um, where we can actually tell people when they can actually start bringing things in and um, what they should be bringing in and what they should not be bringing in. And again, for any of these events, you don't want to bring um, needles, um, any injectable um, types of things. And so, we sure that should be quite prop. <laughs> Spin it up again. <laughs> <coughs> it's, it's, they've been highly productive take backs in the past, like you're talking about, and you're looking forward to this to be a highly successful program going forward for the city of Keene. I think what we're looking for is to level this out a little bit because what, what we've seen is that these one day events. You know, people are bringing things in from 19, I think the earliest dates we had on things was 1973. And, um, you know, we don't want people holding it in their medicine cabinets and their kitchen cupboards anymore. That's the disposal end of it. At the same time, we've got to have the education going on. Education with our young people, education with our parents, education with our um, health care professionals, um, and, uh, you know, gathering a little bit more good information about what the needs are for our senior population, our college population, so that we can make sure as we're trying to address this issue, we're doing it in a way that's going to be effective in the long run. And one of the benefits of doing this is not only getting it off the streets, but then research-wise, it'd be able to say how much of these drugs are being really over-prescribed and not being used at all. Um, it's hard to tell that with these particular one-day events um, because we don't uh, always inventory everything. The one that we did inventory was the one where we knew we had taken back 7,000 controlled substances. Mm -hmm. And controlled substances are you know, very different than your blood pressure yeah. medication. Those are the things that are... Um, most likely to be diverted um, for, you know, the wrong kind of usage. Um, stolen, you know, crime. I mean, we've seen a 
if you talk to law enforcement in this area, we've got quite a rise in crime associated with the number of deaths. Um, and um, you know, New Hampshire now uh, the drugged driving deaths mm -hmm. actually surpass the um, deaths associated with alcohol now. So um, the prescription drugs or drugs in the system actually has passed that um, in the state of New Hampshire. So it is cause for concern. And I think we've, um, I'm aware of, you know, a few of our recent um, death-related accidents um, being associated with substance abuse. And when I was stationed in California, one of the things that they, um, <coughs> they did was they changed from um, driving while intoxicated while driving under the influence and they also had what was called synergy mm -hmm. where wait a minute I only took this one pill and one beer so I'm not drunk and I'm not under the influence but that combination caused you to be impaired and it is you're just as dangerous as if you were driving drunk or driving drugged and you know this is a hard one right now because um, uh, you're right on with that. Um, but one of the things we're seeing is that a lot of states hadn't really been collecting that information. Um, partially because, uh, you know, it's one of those that kind of goes, again, goes under the radar. Yeah. You know, I'm not drunk, I'm not drugged, um, but I'm drunk and drugged. And, um, but they aren't collecting it that way. So now one of the um, moves is to actually, when there's an accident investigation and things, the law enforcement's doing a lot more with collecting that type of information. We're hoping to really work with our law enforcement in this year area so that we can actually collect that. You know, when was alcohol and substances involved and when were um, prescription drugs um, involved? And uh, it's one of those things that, it, you know, it, we talked earlier about, you know, there's a death of a student and sometimes we want to ignore what the contributing factor to that, that death um, was. And I think we do that sometimes with the um, accidents. You know, we're back to that word accidents, but yeah. uh, when you drive under the influence, uh, you no run accident. that risk. It's no accident. It You're, yes. Yep. And so... What else is happening besides just prescription drug take back? Well, there's a lot happening when it comes to substance abuse in the Monadnock <laughs> region and uh, what we're doing to address that. And uh, you're, you're very aware that, you know, we college town here in Keene. Mm -hmm. Keene's just one of our 32 communities that we cover. But um, I was informed through liquor enforcement that they're going to be coming in and uh, they're going to do a saturation. <laughs> and they've got business owners and restaurants that are working with them on this project. And it's really to um, identify fake IDs and get those out of the um, picture, um, particularly with no the college student. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and to um, uh, also send a really strong yeah. enforcement message to the community. So that'll be happening on uh, September 16th and 17th, that they'll be here. We'll be out joining them, um, handing out some good information about uh, binge drinking and over overuse, you know, warning signs. Um, we're not going to try to do a lot of education that night because we figure <laughs> if people have gone out to drink, they, you know, not not looking for education, but, um, you know, we'll be able to give them some information on what they should watch out for as they're drinking. Uh, and um, we have compliance checks always going on. You know, we've been working with the City of Keene on the opt-out um, mm -hmm. initiative and the Monadnock Alcohol and Drug Abuse Coalition, one of our, our nine coalitions, <laughs> has um, been um, significantly <coughs> working on that. So there's a lot happening when it comes to alcohol, marijuana, prescription drugs, um, education to policy. And what I'll do is, <coughs> excuse me, I'll end this with saying, if you buy booze for someone underage, it could cost you two thousand dollars and a year in jail. That and is correct. Or so if you host a party, <coughs> um, if you're a parent who hosts a party in your home, you run some significant risks as well, and it could cost you jail time. And just because they're looking for underage drinkers, they're also looking for overage buyers. Absolutely, and um, all the studies show that uh, the uh, I believe seventy-six percent of underage 
drinkers get their alcohol from somebody of age buying it for them. I want to thank you and hopefully I'll see you on the long road, but the long sober road, not the long drug road. Thank you.